Thank you very much for your presentation. Our next uh, speakers are uh, Franz Filafer and uh, Magdalena Mawetska. Um, they are both um, Max Weber postdoctoral fellows in uh, European University Institute in Florence. And uh, Magdalena is also affiliated with the Institute of Philosophy and so Sociology in Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. Um, Magdalena uh, defended uh, her PhD in philosophy in 2013 and uh, she works um, at the intersection of modern and contemporary philosophy, philosophy of science, legal theory, general methodology, social and behavioral sciences. And uh, Franz, uh, uh, Franz's work uh, has mainly focused on the intellectual history of 18th and 19th century Europe as well as on the history of humanities and of legal culture in the 20th century. So um, today the, uh, they, they will talk us about uh, law and human nature from natural drives to behavioral and co cognitive science. Thank you so much. I'll give you that. Yeah, maybe I, uh, if I we can just thank you so much. much for, for the invitation. We are very happy to be here and so today we would like to present uh, um, our, yeah let's call it this way, our pre preliminary thoughts on the, on the relation between law and, uh, and nature. Uh, so it seemed, uh, we discovered during our fellowship that we share common interests in, in this topic, but, but from very, very different angles. And in May, uh, at the, uh, in Florence, we are organizing a workshop on, on the topic. Um, and this uh, presentation is, is a kind of statement of interest, uh, uh, which could serve as an introduction also for, 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 that, for, for the workshop. And the ch uh, our uh, title changed a little bit. Now it's... Uh, uh, sounds uh, like this, law and nature, but it's, we changed it <laughs> a few days ago. For, uh, law and nature uh, from natural drives to behavioral regularities, and I hope you will understand why we introduced this slight change. So, thank you so much. Um, a law and nature from natural drives to behavioral regularities. Uh, law's relationship to nature was long taken to determine its prestige and legitimacy as a science, as well as its capacity to provide a toolkit for governance. The point of departure for our paper consists in the question whether there are structural similarities between law and the laws of nature as understood in the early modern, and modern periods on the one hand, and present day references to behavioral regularities by legal scholars on the other. If you want to understand how law's capacity to adjust to, address or countervail the lawfulness of nature was conceptualized, we need to take into account that contemporary references are based on research in psychology, economics, decision theory and cognitive science. The relationship between natural law and the laws of nature proves a particularly fertile field of study because it allows us to apprehend early modern and modern conceptions of jurisprudence. In the 20th century, however, natural law slowly recedes to the background where laws of nature remain crucial for social and political interventions. Looking at the emergence of this problem, namely the relationship between legal norms and nature and its historical transmutations, enables us to view afresh contemporary dile dilemmas caused by the reliance on cognitive and behavioral studies. Equally important, this approach also enables us to diagnose the current transition to post-positivist and post-normative modes of employing and conceptualizing law in the public realm. Now, our paper falls into, if I remember correctly, three sections, um, two historical sections uh, and one uh, concluding uh, section. So I shall uh, be responsible for the first section, which I'm now very happy to present to you. Um, laws have served as conceptual arbitrator between nature and scripture since antiquity. Well, if you think of uh, the Stoic conception of Cathiconta or of the Roman conception of Mos Maiorum, um, many examples can be given for this kind of relationship. As long as both nature and scripture were regarded as books written by God, with the Bible reaffirming the content of divine revelation for apostolopsarian mankind, it remained easy to reconcile the laws of nature with the laws that obtained in the social realm and were to be observed by those who lived in it. 
Yet once laws of nature could be taken to exist without divine sanction, as maintained by several thinkers of the Secunda Scholastica and famously by Grotius in his Etiam Sidaremus paradox, the relationship that existed between human action on the one hand and divine predestination or grace on the other became problematic. The status of the laws of nature changed. In the early modern age, nature became all-encompassing in a process that redescribed the place of God. God was increasingly taken to be bound to obey the very laws of nature he had initially enacted or promulgated. Now, it should have been clear from the brief exposition we gave that this was no quintessentially modern achievement, rather the functional context of the older claims about God's non-intervention into the ways of the world, that is, their connection to new ways of observing regularities in nature, was taken to determine the social and political effects these claims had. Use natura and natural law developed into one of the most potent languages of social and political thought. Although conceptualized as immutable, natural law invited rival interpretations regarding social contract, the persistence of primordial rights in society, the legislator's right to abrogate or alter the provisions of natural law, and a crucial topic for our purposes, the issue of human needs, drives, and appetites. Here the question of the suppression or cultivation of these drives within frameworks of natural law quickly surfaced. Despite these tensions, however, natural law's capacity to represent or enact norms prescribed uh, by nature became a key component of law's reputation as a science. Natural law provided a toolkit that made it possible to align and connect different subfields within law, canon law, private law, and public law. In the 18th century, natural law provided an overarching framework that permitted scholars to apprehend subjects as diverse as the natural price of goods, natural interest rates, natural religion, as well as the natural history of mankind. According to the conventional narrative, natural law suffered the demise of the French Revolution. Three, three remarks uh, to qualify this statement are in order. First, natural law came under fire because it was taken to have inspired the revolution, was, ac was accused of having led from the ancient regime administrative guardianship to popular sovereignty. Second, at the same time, contemporaries argued that French citizens' unwillingness to abide by what revolutionaries regarded as the natural law led to the forfeiture of these citizens' rights, the concept of hostis humani generis has to be mentioned in this connection, during the terror. As the critique of natural law had a double bind, it was held to have dismantled the regularities of governance and it was also taken to lay the groundwork for the regularities of behavior framed in terms of the aims of society, making non-compliance with these maxims punishable. It became clear already here that the reference to nature was sufficiently malleable to support several systems, the well-ordered police state on the one hand, a system of mutually reinforcing avarice, interactive greed, as one might say in terms of political economies around 1800, or a voluntary contractualist design of statehood. The same, by the way, held true for the geometrical method or syllogistical method deployed to support these claims. The third point in connection to the demise of natural law uh, has to mention the historical schools of the early 19th century, uh, long credited as kind of dragon slayers of enlightenment in the con conventional, um, conventional uh, historiography. However, more recent research by um, so scholars like Jan Schröder has shown uh, how much these historical schools were actually indebted to 18th century modes of antiquarianism and ancient constitutionalism but that they also retained the systematic architecture and rationalist pyramid of deductions they shared with the natural legalists. Now, in the last section of this part, um, I would like to draw attention to two big shifts in the conceptualization uh, between the connection of laws of nature and natural laws. First, the one uh, which was brought about by Immanuel Kant, and second, uh, by Rudolf von Jering, whom we heard of yesterday. Um, now, Immanuel Kant's oeuvre entailed three complications for the position of jurisprudence at the interstices between laws of nature and natural laws. First, Kant famously disentangled law and morality. Second, he introduced the conception of the systematic formulation of statements about the world that dissociated the form of cognition of erkenntnis from the content of cognition. And third, Kant's conception of moral laws was consequential, but it raised several grave problems. Kant retained the talk of an omniscient, all-beneficent, and almighty God, 
but his function as legislator was dismissed with the claim that human understanding, the Verstand, gave nature its laws. Also, Kant did not quite succeed in clarifying the relationship between the intelligible self and the empirical self. No causal relationships were taken to obtain between them. Nevertheless, the former, the intelligible self, should ameliorate and uplift the latter, the empirical self. At the same time, Kant transferred sin from the depravity and corruption of the empirical world into the realm of the responsible intelligible self, where an allegedly immutable law of morals was set to rule. This moral law, in turn, was allegedly similar to the law of nature, of the exterior world. The laws of this world, however, were prescribed by our understanding, as we have just heard, whose place between those two selves, the intelligible and the empirical one, remained rather vexatious. In the 1850s and 1860s, Rudolf von Jering inverted the priorities of the previous generation of jurists. From the epistemic and political place of law, which was previously defined as a kind of constructional process, Jering shifted the emphasis um, to a process determined by social conditions, by circumstances, purposes, demands, needs, zwecke, in Jering's famous formulation, and power bargains. But this is also interesting because Jering modeled the method um, which jurists had to, um, had to pursue um, in relationship to the method of natural history. So Jering spoke of naturhistorische Methode, method of natural history. According to Jering, lawyers constructed their objects within a mold that resembled the history of nature, studying each body of the law as specimen, an entity capable of, quote, metamorphosis into or association with other bodies. And the need to assort these objects into a system akin to the classificatory schemes of natural historian. Probably Jering thought here of the scheme of Linné. In all, in all likelihood. Hence, we can say that both Kant's and Jering's interventions responded to the increasing rift between the newly emerging natural sciences as a kind of self-contained um, field of inquiry and the humanities, which made nature a legitimate field of expertise of the former, whereas history and society were allotted to the latter. Evidently, this was bound to affect the relationship between the laws of nature and natural laws. There are two apparently contradictory but mutually reinforcing processes at play. Since the early 1800s, there is an unfolding sequence of leading disciplines of natural sciences which provided the template for the morphological, genealogical, and predictive study of society. This sequence led from mechanistic mathematics to geology, which was later replaced by biology and psychology. While the laws of society were modeled after these templates, also by jurists, often with considerable delays and notable lopsidedness in the comprehension and implementation of these models, the autonomy of law as a science was also being restated with certain obstinacy. Neo-Kantianism and, and Kelsen and legal positivism are among the most formidable responses to this challenge, and with this we hand over to the second part of the presentation. Seen, seen in this light, the reinterpretation of Kant by the so-called Neo-Kantian uh, schools was a response to the challenges posed by the naturalization of the philosophy on the one hand and the foundation of ethics on practical reason by Kant on the other hand. According to Hermann Cohen and uh, later also to Hans Kelsen, uh, this move on the part of Kant led to re reaffirmation of natural law based on reason. Hence, Hermann Cohen proposed to provide a transcendental, transcendental foundation for ethics through the reflection on the conditions of possibility of legal science. In Cohen's system, this science of law should fulfill exactly the same function as the science of nature and logic. Uh, both Cohen and Kelsen agreed that neither practical reason nor psychological natural science could serve as a foundation of jurisprudence uh, or of ethics. Hence, the relationship uh, between norms and nature uh, deserved to be tackled anew. And Han Hans Kelsen's legal positivism and his pure theory of law were inspired, among others, by the neo-Kantian reinterpretation of Kant. But as a jurist, uh, Kant, uh, Kelsen shifted the, uh, the emphasis to positive law. For him, positive law was given, and the conditions of its possibility are to be analyzed in the realm of pure theory of law. He understands the purity of legal, uh, uh, of legal theory as independence from the sociological point of view, 
uh, which treats law as a factual phenomenon and from, uh, as well as from doctrines of natural law uh, which reduce legal theory to, f to, to the formulation of ethical and political postulates. And according to Kelsen, the statements of legal science may be compared to laws of nature, since both are general hypothetic statements. Uh, in, the uh, in, law, uh, in the laws in of nature, the consequence is connected with the condition by the principle of causation, whereas in legal norms, the principle of imputation fulfills this function. Um, so uh, we can see that the system of na uh, laws of nature and the system of legal norms have analogous fi features, but they are functioning in, 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 into two, two distinct ontological uh, realms. However, Kelsen uh, also emphasized that law seems to at least partly to be rooted in nature uh, as, as an act of human conduct. Uh, and Kelsen argues that nature, sh na that nature understood by him as a complex of facts and factual occurrences cannot be a source for nor of norms because cog cognition directed to this object can only assert that something is and not that something ought to be. And it seems that for him, a kind of interve intervention of legal norm into the natural, natural, natural realm is possible and even more, that without this kind of intervention, law could not fulfill its function of being uh, an order of human behavior. But Kelsen does not elaborate uh, uh, on this how this in intervention of law <coughs> into the natural realm, realm occurs, and whether its very occurrence that, that doesn't undermine his postulated and presupposed dichotomy of if and this. And this way of thinking about law as intervening into the natural realm, realm has been present also in the contemporary instrumental approaches to law, but obviously without a transcendental presupposition preserving the validity, validity of legal norms. And we are moving somehow in a very uh, indirect way to the problems uh, discussed by, by, our, uh, by our colleague. Uh, so in the, tw the 20th century witness a revival of morally understood and justified natural law, especially after, after the Second World War, uh, and the debate on positive, uh, on positive law separation from moral morality, for example, in the famous uh, Hart-Fuller debate. However, our contention here is that laws of nature were still present, as for example, laws of social interactions or of, or of behavioral regu regu regularities. While not being explicitly named as such, they shape the way of thinking about law and its function as an instrument of influencing behavior and choice. So, so, we, so, our, so our claim is that the, the, the laws of nature were still, well, still informing legal uh, law and policymakers about that, how to govern behavior. So the, the, the discussion about natural law and laws of nature were separated in this in this moment and this way of, this way of thinking has, has its predecessors in American le legal realism and sociological jurisprudence from the 20s and 30, uh, 30s and although these approaches accepted the separation of law from morality they opened the path to conceiving law in instrumental terms and abandoned ideas of grounding law on, on independent a priori principles as well as an autonomous legal science the emphasis was laid on effective policy making and leg legislation, especially in, in, in sociological jurisprudence, um, um, which should be based, effective policy making and legislation, which should be based on scientific analysis of legal impact, grounded in the, grounded in the findings of then flourishing social sciences. And as Oliver Holmes famously stated, the legal scholar of the future is the man of statistic or the master of economics. And these empir empirical studies of law inspired by Holmes and pa Roscoe Pound and others <laughs> led to the development of an approach to the analysis of law, which, would be, which we would like to call here the first stage of law and behavioral sciences. This approach developed in the 50s and 60s in the United States and partly in Europe. Uh, the hope and em emphasis was put on empirical sociology as a science which should provide insights into how law could influence human behavior. One of the discussions which preoccupied scholars at that time 
was the gap problem between law and behavior, that is, the problem of discrepancy uh, between behaviors required by official norms and behaviors observed in social rea reality. The challenge, uh, uh, the challenge was believed to consist in getting rid of, of this discrepancy by making law better su su suited to behavioral patterns and identified. And, they identified. and in the 60s and 70s, economic analysis enter, uh, entered the scene. Uh, since the dawn of law and economics, neoclassical economics with its anthropology of uh, rational util ut utility maximizing was supposed to enlighten law and policymakers. In turn, since the, since the 90s, beha behavioral resistance to neoclassical economic analysis of law is developing. And the devel development of the second stage of the behavioral sciences, uh, uh, of the behavioral approach to law, which we witness nowadays, has been inspired and triggered to great extent by the recent developments in cognitive psychology, emphasizing uh, the importance of, of irrational and affective drives. What we would like to stress here is that in this policy-oriented and instrumental approaches to law aimed at, aimed at governing people's behavior and choices in, in, in an effective manner, we witness analogy to the views on legislation and governing as informed by, as informed by laws of nature. The laws of human behavior to which law and policy, policy makers refer were once laws of social interaction, interactions, at other times laws of ec uh, economic utility maximization, or of psychological or cognitive triggers. All of these laws enter law as mediated through science. These instrumental approaches are related to positivist and realist conviction that law can intervene into the natural realm, now understood mainly as a sphere of human behavior. And this leads us to our three conclusions. Firstly, in the contemporary instrumental approaches discussed so far, the category of validity and of normativity is not treated as requiring any kind of theoretical elaboration. Science is supposed to provide law and policy makers, for, for instance, with knowledge about psychological processes responsible for, for decision making. Lawmakers, informed by psychology, are, are able to efficiently impact behavior, for example, by changing the architecture and context of choice environments and not by, by, and not by, by requiring behavior through norms. Uh, note also that here law is supposed to adjust to behavioral uh, uh, regularities which we would like to treat as, analo as, uh, an, uh, as analogons of, of laws of nature, but rather to countervail them. In a sense, the better the law imitates natural factors, the more effective it is. And that is what we would like to call the post-normative mode of conceiving of law, which we are observing nowadays. And this mode is also post-positivist, since one of the most important features of positivism was, to, was that it conceived of norms as separated, distinct, and, and countervailing laws of nature and not adjusting, and not adjusting to them. And our last uh, yes, and last for the very the very last point, the conclusion, um, we would also like to to emphasise that the current discourse on government um, evinces something like um, an interesting um, reshuffling, reconfiguration of these laws of nature problem. Laws of nature are no longer present in terms of the aims of society as pursued by government. Remember the 18th century debate that surrounded the French Revolution. Instead, these laws of nature continue to inform ideas about how subjects are to be governed in the most effective way, precisely by taking into account the behavioral regularities that ostensibly manifest themselves in their conduct. So thanks so much for your attention.